Hello, everyone, and uh, happy Friday. Uh, welcome to the Tiny ML world. My name is uh, Evgeny Gusev. I am from Qualcomm um, AI Research, and I'm also uh, from Tiny ML Foundation, the chairman of the board there. And we are very, very excited uh, to be here with you today and offer a new project. We call it uh, Tiny ML uh, Trailblazers. It is uh, a project to uncover Tiny ML success stories. So the reason here is very simple. As Tiny ML ecosystem, as Tiny ML grows, as Tiny ML community grows, uh, we see more and more success stories. Uh, success stories are highly contagious. So we'd like you to be exposed to these uh, success stories. You would like you to be impacted, infected in, in a good way there. And, and really, you have an opportunity to, to interact with uh, people who drive tiny ML um, community, tiny ML technology, tiny ML ecosystem forward to, to, to the tiny ML movers, movers and shakers. So today we are uh, super fortunate to have uh, Pete Warden. Pete Warden doesn't need to be introduced to this community. Uh, Pete uh, is uh, one of the uh, founding members and pioneers of, of tiny ML. Um, uh, technology and, and, and the community here. And uh, the success stories will be hosted by uh, Chris Rowan. And Chris is also very well known as a very successful technologist and entrepreneur and a tiny ML pioneer. So hopefully uh, in this series, uh, we'll be able to inspire, to educate, and also uh, the, the, the guests who are going to bring today and, and in, in the future will provide their vision um, to, to, the, to this community. Uh, let me acknowledge uh, TinyML strategic partner. Without their support, uh, this project and other TinyML project would not be possible. So there is a um, long list of companies who, who also play a very active role in, in, in the tiny ML ecosystem. It's AUN devices, ARM, DeepLight, HM Pulse, EMSA, Green Wave Technology, Gravity, HOTG, ImagiMob, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, which is a part of analog devices now, Kixon, Qualcomm, Reality AI, Rickson Technology, Renaissance, SAP, Seed Studio, SenseML, Stream Analyze, AST Microelectronics, uh, Synsense, and Cintian. So let me highlight them one by one. ARM uh, provides a hardware uh, foundation for Fortiny ML. Uh, DeepLight, they make AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Uh, Edge Impulse, Tiny ML for all developers. EMSA, uh, Edge AI visual sensors. Uh, Greenwave Technologies, they enable the next generation of sensors and hearable products to process rich data with energy efficiency. Gravity, software development services for Tiny ML solutions. Uh, HOTG, distributed infrastructure for Tiny ML applications. Latent AI uh, develop adaptive AI for the intelligent age. Maxim integrated enable age intelligence with the uh, low power Cortex M4 uh, technologies. Kixo AutoML, it's AutoML a platform uh, that builds tiny ML solutions uh, for the age using sensor data. Qualcomm advancing AI research to make uh, machine learning uh, ambiguous. Reality AI, they uh, add advanced uh, sensing to your product with Edge AI Tiny ML. Renaissance, uh, this company has a broad and scalable um, Edge computing portfolio. Seed Studio, the IoT hardware enabler. SenseML, um, this company builds smart IoT sensor devices from data. Uh, Synsense uh, builds sensing and inference hardware for ultra low power embedded mobile and edge devices, and Cintian with their neural decision uh, processor. Uh, I am uh, super humbled and uh, honored to 
present our host for this uh, tiny mail series. Uh, Chris and I spoke about this for, for, for a couple of months now, and we thought it would be a great idea to have um, uh, this uh, tiny mail series uh, going, and we came up with the name tiny mail uh, trailblazers, trailblazers, uh, because those are the people who really innovate and uh, pave the way for, for the community uh, to follow. So Chris is a very well-known um, figure in, in, in the high-tech world, and especially in, in the Silicon Valley. He is a technologist by his heart, and uh, he is a very successful entrepreneur here in, in the Bay Area. Uh, and he, he is also one of the pioneers in the tiny ML space. Uh, Chris, uh, one of the companies he founded uh, recently was uh, Bubble Labs. That's a tiny ML audio company. Uh, and this company was uh, had a successful exit uh, recently um, with the m a with Cisco, and, and the Chris is a VP of uh, engineering there. So prior to, to Bubble Labs, uh, Chris uh, served as a CTO for Cadence IP Group, which he joined after Cadence acquisition of Tensilica. That's another successful company. Everyone knows Tensilica. And Chris uh, was a co-founder or founder of uh, Tensilicon, and it was back in, in the in the late eighties. Uh, and that company, as you know, Tensilicon developed um, uh, very efficient processors, actually a family of different processors. And he led Tensilicon as CTO, and, and later uh, they developed more and more um, embedded type of processors as well. Uh, one thing about Chris, he was a pioneer in developing risk architecture, actually, before risk uh, was widely um, and successfully known as, as today. And he helped found MIPS uh, computer systems in um, 1984. Uh, uh, Chris graduated from Stanford uh, in, in physics, just, just like me, uh, I mean, in physics. Uh, and uh, he has uh, many recognitions, and, and one of them is IEEE uh, Fellow um, recognition in 2015 for developing microprocessor technology. So I cannot think a better host for this tiny ML success story series uh, as Chris, because he has a great blend, great mix of entrepreneurship, technology, and, uh, and uh, general wisdom and experience with him. So Chris, uh, thank you for, for being the host and being the designer for this series and um, the stage is yours. Great. Well, thank you, Evgeny, very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to do this. And, and maybe I should start even before I introduce Pete, which I'm really looking forward to, to talk a little bit about our goals for the series as a whole. I think Pete is a great person to start off with but I want to try and frame the purpose of this uh, a little bit. What we hope with this is to look at the interaction of the tiny ML technologies, the process of innovation and the process of entrepreneurship. And I'm taking a broad definition of entrepreneurship here. This isn't just what startups do. Uh, this isn't just what small companies do, though that's pretty central. But there is a, a related kind of entrepreneurship that takes place in big companies, in academia, in industry organizations. And we really want to cover all of those different dimensions of, of entrepreneurship, of thinking through the use cases, thinking through the applications, and figuring out how the technology is adapted, not, not just so that it's successful by the technical metrics of of, of microwatts and uh, inferences per second, but it's also successful in terms of changing the world, of getting out there and proliferating and becoming widely used as a set of ideas or as a product or as a technology foundation. And when we think about this kind of entrepreneurship, it shares many common elements with every other kind of tech entrepreneurship we come across, where there's kind of a three-legged stool. You have to bring together a, a use case, an understanding, an application, which often implies a business model. You have to bring to bear a technology which is appropriate to solving that problem of, uh, of the customer or the application in a, in a fresh way. 
And you have to bring together some people with the right skills and, and really the right personalities in order to do something that's never been done before. But there's also a lot which is quite different, quite unique about the tiny ML space. And we want to understand how tiny ML shifts the formula, changes the goals, changes the vocabulary that we need to use in talking about entrepreneurship. You know, what's different about tiny ML entrepreneurship uh, and, you know, dog walking service entrepreneurship? There are kind of a few things that, that, that matter there. There are technology dimensions where we really have to bring together in different combinations for different kinds of, of, um, of startups or uh, innovation efforts. Some of it's around the system, around the application. Some of it's specific or specifically around algorithms and models. Some of it is ML tools. Some of it is silicon. Some of it is data sets and other IP. But organizations have to typically focus in one area, but leverage all of the others in order to be successful. There are also some different and unique characteristics about tiny ML systems that shape what technologies, what business models, and ultimately what people uh, get involved. It's highly resource constrained. It's real time. You're often working directly on raw sensor streams. And these systems are always on or mostly on and typically are serving as filters. That is, the whole processing of this data is not typically taking place in the tiny ML system. It's usually something where it wakes up, it notices something, and then it's forwarding data onto the cloud or it's waking up a big processor or it's talking to uh, some centralized service just in those cases when something interesting is happening. And what's so unique about this tiny ML revolution is that we're able to put so much more intelligence in this filtering, in this first level of processing that allows us to have much more responsive, much more efficient systems than we ever could before. And that's opening up thousands of new applications and thousands of new uh, business model and entrepreneurial possibilities. And what we're doing here is sort of trying to build a bit of a roadmap to what are all those opportunities and what are the techniques that entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs broadly defined, can use to exploit and discover uh, that wealth of, of applications and systems. So that's the context. That's what we're trying to achieve uh, as we develop this series. So with that, I'd really like to introduce Pete now. We've got a, we've got a slide for Pete, right? There, go. <laughs> there he is. So Pete is a pretty unique guy in the industry. I mean, he's pretty visible because He's been so effective as both a evangelist and a technologist around uh, low power embedded uh, ML applications. He's the technical lead for the TensorFlow Lite micro open source project. Uh, he is very visible as a uh, creator of fundamental new data sets, as a um, as a speaker, as a promoter of a whole suite of, of technologies and almost philosophies about the approach to uh, building efficient uh, ML systems uh, and uh, is uh, really a, a very influential guide for all of us in what's happening and what's coming next. So um, Pete, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's a very kind introduction, Chris. <laughs> so I'd like to start with 
kind of a basic question, which is how would you describe uh, what your role is? How would you how would you characterize how you mix together being an enabler, an evangelist, a generalizer, a researcher, uh, a uh, an engineering leader? How do you how do you do that? How do you how do you think what, of what your job is? So I honestly think of my job as um, filling in gaps where I see them, because almost everything that I you know that I talk about um, is something that somebody else had I've learned from somebody else in mm -hmm. a particular domain and uh, that it isn't very well known kind of elsewhere um, and I feel really lucky to be in this position with TensorFlow Light Micro where we have all of these different product teams inside Google and outside you know trying to use our technology to build stuff and um, they run into a lot of problems, for example. Um, and so I'm able to kind of gather together, okay, these are the sorts of things that people want to do. These are the requirements. And on the other side, I have all of these people building really interesting pieces of hardware and building kind of, you know, software, things like the SimSys NN package or you know, uh, Qualcomm's, uh, you know, or Cadence, uh, you know, have all of these software libraries and all of these other companies have all these really interesting pieces of hardware where I get to hear about all the things that they can do and kind of try and tell the world about those. And really, I'm kind of... Um, uh, middle management <laughs> in a lot of ways for a lot of this stuff, just kind of um, transferring a lot of the things that might only be well known in one particular area um, and trying to actually like share them with the rest of the world. So I'm really grateful for everybody who's asking me questions and coming to me with, you know, kind of interesting things that are happening um, because I get to kind of share them and, you know, often kind of sounds smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in that sense, you're really a pollinator. Of, yes. So yeah, my, you're sort of going from, from bum, as a bumblebee from uh, technical flower to technical flower. And my, fav my favorite phrase, whenever I can say, like, you guys should talk, like, <laughs> I feel <laughs> like that, that's usually, a, you know, feels like a success. <laughs> How did, how did you get involved in ML, especially embedded ML? What, what brought you to this spot? So I had um, Jetpack, and what we were trying to do was make sense of all these billions of social photos that are out there in the world and trying to build something like Yelp, but kind of automatically off of photos. So sort of telling where hipsters hung out by where lots of people with moustaches <laughs> were uh, <laughs> taking photos. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd been doing machine learning on and off for, you know, over a decade um, and it never worked. Um, and suddenly sort of AlexNet came out and deep learning uh, you know, I started playing with it and it's like astonishing to me because it actually worked really well. Um, and it also didn't require a lot of programming. You kind of set up the model and you threw the data at it. And that was kind of it. So that that was kind of the first big revelation. And then when I joined Google, um, you know, I was feeling pretty proud of what we built with Jetpack because, hey, we could get a model down to like three megabytes. And then I talked to, um, in 2014, I talked to Raziel Alvarez, who's now um, now at Facebook and leading the um, a lot of their mobile work. Uh, but at the time he was running the kind of wake word, the OKG, I won't say the full word in case it wakes up everybody's phone. Um, but um, he was leading that effort and he told me, oh, yeah, we're using a 13 kilobyte model to run on phones in the always on mode. Yeah, what's, and, what's a factor of a thousand improvement? 
I know, and I I had never even heard of this. I was just my mind was blown, and it just got me thinking. Wow, if it's effective for this, you know, quite difficult problem, you know, recognizing somebody saying a word、um, or a phrase, I wonder what else we can do、um, in this. Kind of, you know, I wonder all the other things that we could use this for,、um, and that was that was really, you know, that's that's been the continuous sort of drive for me. Is like, wow, it just feels like this is a really interesting combination of technologies, and let's see what we can build with this. So as you get involved in your in your pollinator role.、Um, <laughs> What do you see as being some of the real necessary ingredients for the the formula that you feel needs to come together in terms of what kind of technologies people need to have, or what kind of organization, or even what sort of attitude they need in order to really leverage these. Ultra low power, small footprint, resource constrained, real time、uh, ML applications. I honestly think one of the most important things is to kind of develop an intuition for what these networks can do, like what they're good at and what they aren't good at,、um, because they aren't magic. They're kind of just another piece of technology.、Um, they're kind of this. You know, I'm still kind of astonished at the things they can do,、um, but they're also very dumb. You know, we still have the classic computer science problem of garbage in, garbage out,、um, and they are easy to,、um, you know, it's easy to get them to、uh, a point where they, you know, make mistakes,、um, and getting playing around with them and just kind of getting a feel for, okay, these are their strengths. These are their weaknesses.、Um, understanding,、uh, you know, one of the classic problems is like, you know, they've done really well in things like ImageNet, where you have a thousand different classes of images、uh, of different objects and images you want to kind of classify.、Um, but the problem is that with like an ImageNet model, they will always try and pick one of those thousand classes, even if The thing that you're looking at isn't one of those classes. So I always had this problem where I, you know, I was initially demonstrating ImageNet running on a phone,、um, and I would point it at like a dinner plate、um, because dinner plates weren't in the,、uh, you know, set of classes. It would、um, pick toilet seat instead. <laughs> and, It's sort of like.、Uh... Uh, you know, there's a certain class of people that I characterize as、uh, frequently in error, never in doubt. Yes, <laughs> and like absolutely certain, it's like I know what this is, and it's like, but you only know a thousand different things, and you're definitely going to say it's one of those. Like, no matter what we throw at you,、um, so that kind, you know, that's that's one of the. Things that often trip people up because they see these incredible like accuracy scores, and don't necessarily realize that you know, like you say, they're like these people who are always certain、um, about you know their their sort of you know decision,、uh, even if they're completely out of their、um, domain. <laughs> yeah, Now, certainly one of the characteristics. Of innovation in the ML space as a whole is that you can only do well where there are good data sets, or where you can find a good data set that that really reflects the problem you're actually trying to to solve. And you've directly addressed this in the area of of wake words or small vocabulary、uh, of recognition.、Uh, say a little bit about that. Data set development process because that's become really universally used by researchers, at least in the、uh, in the in the wake word or、uh, small vocabulary 
uh, speech recognition uh, area. And, but, but generalize a little bit about how organizations need to think about data sets that are going to allow them not only to do a good job technically, but actually create some unique uh, functionality or service or, or product. So one of the most common questions I get is um, how many samples of data do I need to train my network? Um, and as any like researcher will say, you know, that's, there, there is no kind of, you know, one answer for that. Um, but what I usually end up actually saying is a thousand per class, <laughs> just because <laughs> that that is that is kind of at least at least it's kind of gives gives people something of a kind of an order of magnitude of the order of magnitude or something like that of uh, what they need to be uh, kind of thinking about for um, gathering data. Um, but even sort of beyond that, um, the thing that I really encourage people to do, and, you know, I've been seeing this all the way back from, you know, when I first started looking at Kaggle competitions and, you know, the Kaggle team, if you don't know them, are um, this really interesting uh, startup that got acquired by Google that runs um, data set competitions, like ML competitions for um, companies and organizations uh, where they gather a set of uh, data and then ask people to develop models to solve a particular problem around that. Um, and the biggest challenge for them uh, was has been that they actually have to spend a lot of time with companies to figure out what the question that needs answering actually is, even before they're like gathering the data because, you know, like an insurance company, you know, they, they don't necessarily know what they want out of kind of medical data. It's like they, they, they really have to spend a bunch of time just even figuring out, okay, what, what is the actual thing that you want, the question you want to answer in a very specific way? Um, and one of the ways that I've worked with teams to um, help them do this is what we call Wizard of Ozing, where you have a man behind the curtain or a woman, um, but uh, who's pretending to be the machine learning model, like somebody sitting at a laptop looking at an image that a user presents to them as part of this mocked up application or listening to audio or looking at some text and has to kind of, you know, press a button on the keyboard to give the decision that a neural, you, you're hoping a neural network would give. Um, and that lets people actually try the product end to end before you've done any machine learning, you know, any of that sort of, you know, X months of machine learning development and understand if they're even asking the right question. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, so that that is really um, kind of stepping back. That's the the big change for a lot of these, you know, companies and organizations who are looking to create products is um, just trying to even frame the problem in a way that's tractable for machine learning is um, you have to kind of think about things differently and you have to kind of, you know, it's well worth spending a bunch of time up front to like really understand the problem that you're trying to solve before you kind of like, you know, throw a bunch of machine learning PhD people at it. Yes. I think that is really one of the occupational hazards for people in the deep learning space is that the technology can, when you have the right data and the right question, be so magical that people want to jump right away. To, to training something. And they often do find, in fact, that they've solved an interesting problem, but not the one that they need to. And, and they need to spend a good bit of time in figuring out how does this actually fit into the system I'm trying to build? What, what do I need the, the ML to do uh, to this data stream? 
So sometimes you're trying to extract some specific piece of information from it. That is, you're doing a classifier of some kind. Sometimes you're doing a transformation. It's really uh, directly uh, uh, generating an output stream from an input stream. And you have to really know what those characteristics are. And in fact, one of the great challenges I think that, that, that my teams have found is that you need to get very precise in how you define what the relationship is of the input stream to the output stream and figure out, well, how do you generate uh, ground truth? Uh, for classification, you can directly use humans to say, okay, I can look at it or listen to it and say, oh, that's the, that's the class this is. Uh, but if you've got stream to stream transformations, you really have to uh, describe in almost uh, algorithmic or mathematical terms what it is that you want as the relationship between the input and the output. That's, that's, I think, one of the challenges in many of these tiny ML cases is that um, you, you can't typically with a video or an audio, when you're doing stream to stream transformations, say, oh, I'm going to have a human, you know, listen to the input stream and create the output stream. They cannot label their way uh, to success. And so framing the question, as you say, really becomes so central. It is in fact, um, you know, if, if, if training the model is 90% of the work, framing the problem is the other 90% of the work. <laughs> And I think it's one of the reasons that people often have to iterate a good bit in order to come up with something that doesn't just have good ML characteristics, actually solves the, the application problem. I'm curious, as you've looked across, you know, both projects you've worked on directly and projects you've observed, what are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the false starts and disappointments that you've, you've seen along the way? <laughs> yes, yes. No, I, I, I do, I do have uh, a fair number of uh, scars um, of uh, you know. There's, there's been a lot of you know, a lot of failures. Um, one of the things that I've actually had to, you know, I, I'm not a, a native of the embedded systems world like I've had to learn about the embedded systems world over the last like five years or so um, mm -hmm. and I kind of came into this with the expectation that optimization was primarily going to be around latency because that's sort of what I'm used to being the really um, uh, the limiting factor for things like mobile phone applications is you have to have them to run fast enough so that it, they're interactive for the user. Um, what I've actually found uh, for most products, the most likely reason, technical reason that they're likely to fail is that they don't fit into the memory budget. Because if you only have a few hundred kilobytes and you're trying to do a whole bunch of things, you know, like we are on the phone, there's a whole bunch of different uh, tasks that are running on the always on sensor hub of a uh, phone, um, you really have a very, very hard limit on how much memory you can use. And if you go over that, even by a byte, you just can't ship. Um, it's not like you have any like wiggle room, like you might with latency where things will work, but the sort of experience will be degraded. Um, the hard limits on memory have really been something that I've had to kind of learn about again and again. Um, and really the mindset of writing code to optimize the binary footprint um, is a really um, a, something that I have to keep sort of, you know, reminding myself of and keep thinking about how to, uh, you know, how to change my kind of default trade-offs that I'm coming into this space with 
to uh you know make a habit of saying hey this may run a bit slower but that doesn't matter because it saves us um you know it saves us a kilobyte um and that's that's been the um the thing that uh the technical thing that i've seen stop more products and potential application ship than anything else um is oh it just doesn't yes. it doesn't fit so we're gonna have to like wait for the next uh you know next we'll wait for next version of the phone or you know whatever it is yeah i know that in, in some of the work that that Babel labs did in ultra small footprint speech recognition systems it wasn't just the model size the code was nothing the model size was significant but we had late surprises in just how much the input and output buffering of the streams require that you start double buffering things in order to you know be able to work on you say oh well those really add up you know you can you can you can lose you know 20 kilobytes to buffering without without even a, a blink and and suddenly your 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 budget is uh, is compromised so there really are some 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 hard things in, in doing that. I sort of followed an opposite journey. I've been working in embedded systems for a long time, um, really since probably starting Tensilica, uh, you know, focused largely on embedded systems. But in the last couple of years, I've gone you know full enterprise, cloud centric, distributed. Uh, applications with uh, with Cisco and, and WebEx, uh, and now in fact even there a lot of the ML happens at the edge, not in the cloud, and so some of these things about being very efficient in terms of of memory footprint and compute carry over in a direct sort of way, but the scale of the system is so large and complex compared to what you're doing when you're building a you know a little uh, button battery widget. Uh, it, it's quite striking, but it, it, it really is interesting. This whole spectrum of things as you build this almost this hierarchy of processing from ultra low power, you know, always on tiny ML things that talk to maybe phones or, or PCs or, or local servers, which talk to, you know, global databases and big back ends that you uh, you need to simultaneously focus in on the piece you really have to solve, but you also have to be cognizant of what's the whole flow of data through the, through the system. And so, you know, I've certainly found that uh, that cloud know-how is actually very important to thinking about the, the applications, but you do have to discipline yourself to sort of say, oh, you know, computing really costs uh you know locality matters uh you know fitting in these tiny budgets matter i, I can't just spin up another instance and say okay well it costs 10 percent more than i expected no <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 very hard boundaries sometimes so so what are the big challenges that you see going forward you know, not only what are the big problems but who needs to solve some of those problems because you know, we're a community, not just individuals working on these problems. So the biggest challenge I see is just getting the people who are trying, who are facing the problems that could potentially be solved by this combination of embedded systems and uh, machine learning. The, the knowledge and the comfort level and like the experience and the tools to actually uh, solve these problems. Because um, I don't think it's the case that there's going to be this kind of new generation of people coming in and just kind of, you know, doing everything because there's so much domain knowledge um, mm. that's needed for a lot of the really interesting problems that uh, need to be solved. Um, I really think that there's we if we're going to be successful, 
we're going to have to figure out how to um, train people up who already know about, you know, the embedded system development, especially, and know about these very specialized, um, you know, problem domains and show them how to use these new tools. Um, and, you know, there aren't that many college courses. Almost everybody in the industry will not have been exposed to one of these courses at college unless they're sort of a very new graduate. Um, so how can we actually, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of giving people a lot of Lego pieces and saying, hey, you can use these to solve, you know, solve your problem. But how do we sort of give them instructions and kind of the confidence to um, use the technology uh, that that's kind of come out? And, uh, you know, I've been trying to do like the online edX course. So, you know, getting a book out there, getting, you know, open source examples and things like that. But I really feel like that's only scratching the surface. Um, I think that we we. I really want to see loads more people kind of picking this up, loads more people feeling like, oh, yeah, this is something I can do, uh, you know, is the first barrier because machine learning really f has this kind of a lot of jargon and off-putting kind of aura of, you know, oh, you have to have like a PhD uh, in, you know, computer science to even kind of, you know, start using it. Um but I think we know that it, there are all sorts of very accessible ways that you can kind of get started. And you don't have to understand all the weird stuff that's happening under the hood in order to successfully use it. Right. Yeah, so true. This is probably a good time for us to start uh, taking some of the questions from the audience. We've got a handful of questions that have been, been posted, but I really encourage people to uh, put up some more questions. Um, I I see some of them here, and I'll uh, maybe I'll read them out. This is one that uh, says, uh, "This is from Stefan. Pete, you've been in ML long before ML hype happened. One could say that you had a good had a good feeling of capturing the essence of things to come. What <laughs> do you see? What promising fields do you see that are coming?" after ML or with ML in the next 10 years? <laughs> wow, that's a big, uh, <laughs> honestly, All I mean, question. yeah, that's a, that's a big question. And I would actually say I, I jumped on the bandwagon when the hype was already starting, like back in like 20, you know, 2010, 2011, you know, I, I was not one of these people who was working away in kind of obscurity on your networks when nobody believed in them. Um, I very much kind of saw the success of AlexNet um, and kind of jumped on that bandwagon, you know, maybe comparatively early. But as long as I've been working with this ML stuff, there's 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 been a, a lot of hype. Um, but I... I honestly, I'm, you know, one of the things I've said is even if all of the researchers just kind of went on strike tomorrow and we had no new advances in machine learning, the application of just all of the existing models and techniques that have emerged in the research world um, to, you um, all of these really interesting domains and adapting them to embedded systems. I mean, I think we can be working very productively on these for years, if not decades. Um, so I'm, I'm almost uh, like not even thinking kind of, I'm definitely not over machine learning yet. And I'm not thinking that much kind of, of a, post machine learning world just because I see so much work to do with all of the kind of discoveries and technologies that the research and the academic world have uncovered for us and kind of you know developing those into things that we can actually help end users uh, with um, 
you know, I'm sure you have ideas on what technology is coming, Chris, and I'd love to hear them, but I'm so sort of like, my head is so full of all of the things we can do with these technologies that we haven't been able to apply yet that I, I couldn't even think about, you know, I couldn't even give you a good answer of what's coming after. It's, it's certainly true that the number of potential applications only seems to be growing exponentially. And so there's probably more opportunity to deploy ML into, into new systems than there was five years ago when it seemed like, you know, there were only two people who were able to do it and there were, you know, a thousand applications. Well, now there are a thousand people that can do it, but there are 10 million applications uh, out there that, that need solving. That is, the scope of possible solutions is effectively infinite. We are not going to saturate anytime soon the, uh, the potential to, to use ML to solve these problems. But I also think it's sometimes very useful to remember that ML is a programming. It's really a way of saying, well, instead of describing an algorithm, I'm going to provide a data set. And my data set is really what determines well, what the functionality of the system is, as opposed to the algorithm writer deciding what the functionality is. And in that sense, the inner workings, exactly what the layer cake is of convolutions and skip layers and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and loss functions is somewhat secondary to the question of where do I have interesting data to go do something? How do I put it into the larger context where the, the kind of, of behaviors that are in the sweet spot of a, of a data trained model uh, allow me to do some, some new things? And since the world is more full than ever of, of data sets, especially unappreciated data sets, I think that, that creates this huge opportunity. Uh, and I don't think we have to to worry too much about, oh, there's going to be, you know, something beyond the convolutional neural network that will somehow change it. The fundamental thing is that we now know how to use data directly to describe the behavior of systems that we want. And in that sense, I think it's as fundamental as when we sort of discovered that we could program um, in high level languages, especially for the tiny ML analogy, we can program little microcontroller uh, based systems in high level language. And there really was an analogous revolution in what people got out of embedded electronics when you had this huge step up in the sophistication and the productivity of, 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 of programming all this embedded stuff. It's not the same, but it was transformational back in the 80s and 90s when people started programming small systems in, in high level languages and could produce you know, orders of magnitude more functionality uh, than ever before. So that was that was key. So we have a, a, another question from uh, Saman. When you think about enabling ML on small devices, do you uh, do you think the focus should be more on algorithm optimization, like smaller and more efficient models, or on other post-training methods, like quantization, pruning, knowledge distillation, et cetera? Um, I, I really think um, the first thing that I point people to is uh, just see if you can use a standard model, but just make it smaller. Um, you know, before before you sort of go down the, uh, you know, the route of using, um, you know, more sophisticated approaches, like quantize it down to 8-bit, that's, that's a very sort of, um, you know, pretty well understood and very um, reliable, uh, you know, it can be tricky to get right, but it's once, you know, once you do the conversion, it's uh, pretty reliable. Um, but other than that, um, what I found with real product teams is they often get the most mileage just by 
shrinking down the uh, the actual model architecture and um, worrying much more about the um, data that you're feeding in to training um, to improve the accuracy versus trying to improve the accuracy by kind of trying to use more sophisticated kind of pruning and sparsity and other techniques. Um, you, we've really found that you get a lot more kind of likely return on your investment from spending time actually figuring out how to better label your data set, gather more data, um, set up the classes better, um, identify kind of bad, um, you know, uh, training samples and things like that versus spending that engineering time on um, much beyond kind of a plain vanilla, take a, you know, a fairly well-known network, make it as big as you can fit and, you know, uh, have it quantized. Um, and then I really encourage people to just kind of like leave it and not get too pulled into the model architecture and, you know, all these sophisticated techniques, but focus on the data. Yeah, I have to say I'm obsessed about the, the data as well, in the sense that I think a so-so model architecture on good data will always be a perfect model on so-so data. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we have a question here from Go Ching. Uh, you've talked a lot about optimization in footprint and resource utilization. What's your advice on ML development methodology? Huh. Um, really trying to figure out how you can get what you're doing in front of, in like a realistic use case situation as uh, quickly as possible and being able to iterate as fast as possible um, and get feedback as fast as possible is the most important thing. You know, I mentioned the sort of Wizard of Oz um, kind of approach um, earlier. Um, you know, even before you get something running on an embedded device, if you, for example, can get your voice um, algorithm like running on like a laptop using a laptop's microphone and see what kind of results you get there and kind of like mock up the application um, outside of the embedded space and just kind of understand how well it works and better understand the requirements of what you need to do as quickly as possible um, and be able to just kind of like iterate on trying new variations of the model and the data and all the other combinations um it, it really um that that is my main you know main advice on like the methodology is just try and experiment and have prototypes um that you can iterate on as quickly as possible yeah and my contribution to that question would be uh model the system context you know, really understand how it's going to be be used i mean it's kind of like the wizard of Oz. Uh, but it is often when you look at things at the system level that you have aha moments like, oh, you know what? I really only have to run this model once a minute, not once a second. So I've saved a factor of 60 there. There are very few things you're going to do in the model optimization which are going to save you a factor of 60. Uh, so system context and therefore modeling of the system context early enough that you actually can adapt the ML model to the system context is, is pretty key. Um, we've got some other questions from the Haradin. Uh, last Wednesday, we had a tiny, tiny ML webcast for uh, Alphys framework, where they said that now you can perform training on microcontrollers. Does this include training uh, CNN. I, I don't know if you know this particular system, but, but what's the role of training at the edge in your mind? So this comes up a lot. Um, what I've uh, found is that honestly, our hands have been pretty full just doing a lot of inference. 
um, the, there are a few places where training has come up. Um, one of them is actually coming back to the wake word, the OKG example um, that I talked about at the start, um, where when you set up your phone, you actually say the wake word phrase a few times. Um, and interestingly enough, that is not using full like back, back propagation. That is just taking an embedding vector for each time you say the phrase and then using distance from that embedding vector to help customize the output of the network to better recognize you saying that wake word phrase versus other people. So that's a great example of where you can get a lot of the benefits of training without having to do full back propagation. Um, and similar examples are doing like transfer learning to just kind of retrain like the top layer. Um, the one place where full training has actually looked like it's pretty interesting is anomaly detection for things like predictive maintenance, where you really want to figure out what you know, run for 24 hours stuck to a machine and figure out, okay, this is normal operation, and then try and detect kind of anomalies from that previous performance that you've learned because you have to kind of learn it for each machine that you're attached to. Um, but there, are, there haven't been that many situations where we've actually wanted to do, uh, where we've seen product teams who who need to do anything like full training. Um, we've got time uh, maybe for one short question here um, from uh, Srinivas. In the world out there, do you know how much about how ML is really being used in deployed applications versus lab research? In other words, how much AI ML deployment in, in real world applications is happening and at what scale? Yeah, so, I mean, the OKG wake word recognition, um, I don't have exact numbers, but you know, it's, it's on billions of Android phones. So, uh, you know, that's, that's one of my, uh, you know, classic things I point to is that this, you know, this stuff is out there, it's powering, um, you know, important applications. Um, there are um, a lot of, uh, especially around, uh, you know, Chris knows a lot about voice applications. There are lots and lots of um, things that are around doing voice recognition, activation and things on the edge and even things around audio processing, you know, improving the audio quality of, you know, um, you know, recordings and calls and things like that, that's uh, happening. So I see a lot of stuff around voice happening at scale. I feel like other areas um, are still kind of in more early days. There are production deployments of, you know, things around accelerometers and really low power camera stuff but not on that same scale that we have for voice. Yeah, well, certainly voice as, as an embedded and video as embedded applications are, are very widely de deployed. I mean, you know, you've got automotive applications, you have, you know, public surveillance applications of, of, of various kinds. You've got lots of uh, audio trigger word, audio filtering kinds of things, as well as as uh, motion sensing streams. I think it's really out there in significant numbers, uh, but it's gonna happen quietly uh, in part because I think it is becoming more and more a standard part of many people's toolkit. So when they build embedded systems, more and more people are just including sometimes simple, sometimes more sophisticated uh, models, but it's definitely happening. But with that, I think we need to uh, pass it back to Evgeny uh, for any wrap up for uh, business. And Pete, I want to thank you for uh, sharing this hour uh, with us. It's been great. No, thanks so much, Chris. And thanks, everybody. I think uh, no comments from me, Chris. Uh, great discussion. And thank you, Pete, for joining. I think it's always uh, kind of a pleasure to, to hear your wisdom and uh, 
kind of sharing your experience. And I, I really like the analogy you made about the intuition, Lego box applications, and the billion of OKG type of applications. I think we have a lot of questions um, still on chat. We'll probably continue this um, on, 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 on forum. I mean, people were asking about technical questions and application type of questions like tiny email for metaverse I mean, that's probably separate <laughs> separate uh, interview on its own like how tiny email can be used in, in the metaverse world so so really great so i think we'll have this uh, serious monthly today was a bit an outlier of friday because of the uh, conflict schedule we'll, we'll do them on wednesday in the middle of the week and just check out your uh email and social media LinkedIn for announcements. I think next one is going to be in January. We have also excellent guests there. And thank you, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Chris. And um, I think um, happy holidays, everyone. Thank you to the audience for good yeah. questions and for the attention. Yeah. Uh, ARM, uh, software and hardware for TinyML. Uh, deep light uh, 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 AI to make AI faster, smaller. Uh, Edge Impulse, uh, tiny map for developers. EMSA Edge uh, AI vision sensors. Uh, green Wave Technologies enabling the next gen of sensor uh, and hearable products to process rich data with energy efficiency. Gravity uh, software development services for tiny ML solutions, uh, HOTG distributed infrastructure for tiny ML applications, Latent AI, they develop adaptive AI for the intelligent, intelligent edge, Maxim integrated enabling edge uh, intelligence with the low power Cortex M4 devices, Kixo uh, AutoML tool, it's kind of another AutoML company. Uh, Qualcomm advancing AI storage to make uh, efficient AI ambiguous. Reality AI at advanced sensing uh, to your products with Edge AI Tiny ML. Uh, Renaissance, they have a broad and scalable edge computing portfolio of different silicon products. Seed uh, Studio, the IoT hardware enabler. Uh, SenseML, uh, doesn't need to be introduced here. Chris did an amazing job here. Uh, since then, uh, from Switzerland, they built sensing and inference hardware uh, for low power um, neuromorphic computing chips. And since then, uh, they develop end to end deep learning solutions for TinyML and um, Edge AI.